17th is really to change the conversation around how we talk about women in politics. We are firm believers that all issues are women's issues. Our readers are people who want to be better informed and better able to participate in democracy. We're aiming to change the future of American journalism by giving women the platform and the voice that they deserve. There's never been a better moment than right now. The 19th is the newsroom that we've been waiting for. Hi everyone and welcome to day three of the 19th Represents, a week of virtual events aimed at elevating the voices of women changing the game in politics and public policy. My name is Amanda Zamora and I'm the co-founder and publisher of the 19th, a nonprofit newsroom that launched last week at the intersection of gender, politics, and policy. Over the last two days, we've interviewed women who've broken incredible boundaries by being elected to office people like Senators Tammy Duckworth and Catherine Cortez Masto. And we've explored the work in progress that is suffrage in America with people like voting rights activist Stacey Abrams. Today, we're going to stretch our horizons with conversations on what's at stake in the fight for gender equity and opportunity in the US and abroad. We're going to start with a woman who's done more than almost any other to lead that change domestically and internationally, Melinda Gates the co-chair of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and the founder of Pivotal Ventures. After that, we'll hear from musician and women's empowerment activist, Madam Gandhi, and we'll round out the day hearing from female congressional candidates working to change the face of conservatism in the US. Before we begin today's programming, I wanna thank the sponsors and philanthropic partners who've made this week possible. They include Goldman Sachs, Intuit, The Impact Seat, The Lenfest Institute, the Philadelphia Inquirer, the Wincote Foundation, the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, the Barbara Lee Family Foundation, the Stardust Fund, PEN America, the Heinz Endowments, CVS Health, the Panacea Collective, Aero PR, and Lingua Franca. I also want to let you know that the 19th is a member-supported newsroom, and we can't put on great free programming like this without your support. We hope you'll join us at 19thnews.org every $19 counts. If you missed Monday or Tuesday's programming or just want to watch again, visit 19thnews.org forward slash events. With that, I'm thrilled to introduce the 19th's co-founder and CEO, Emily Ramshaw, to kick off today's programming with Melinda Gates. Well, welcome, Melinda. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are thrilled to have you as part of the 19th Represents. Thanks for having me, Emily. Yes, wonderful. Well, uh, first I want to say, uh, in the interest of full disclosure, the 19th is so grateful for your support of our endeavor. So happy to get off the ground and so happy to be part of your effort to empower and engage women, particularly in the civic engagement arena. So thank you again for that. So uh, welcome. And, and that's where I want to start our conversation today. You know, in, in 2019, you announced that you were committing a, a billion dollars to gender equity in the United States, uh, an enormous sum to address an enormous problem. Uh, that work has really included a nonpartisan push to get women more deeply engaged in our democracy. And I just wanted to ask, you know, particularly in this moment in history, why is that push so important? And why is the nonpartisan piece so important to you? Well, you know, when we project ahead how long until we would get true equality in the United States, the World Economic Forum says, looking at the data, it's 208 years away till true equality in the United States. And I think we all think, no, that's just too long. And I think women really need to be pushed and propelled forward to have their full power and influence in a number of sectors. But one of the key sectors is politics. Because in politics is where we set policy for the nations, for our citizenry. And so unless you have equal representation of women who bring this different lens of society to the Hill, I don't think that we will ever really get all the policies right in this country for women and people of color. And so sort of jumping off of that, you know, how do you reconcile this domestic moment, um, you know, th this work that you're focusing on domestically, this commitment to women with this moment in history, you know, with the 100th anniversary of suffrage for white women uh, against a backdrop of a modern day civil rights movement, a global pandemic. I mean, I know you all have invested across a whole range of issues, but sort of how do you prioritize in a moment that feels this fraught? 
Well, I think we need to both commemorate this centennial moment. Uh, it was a very important moment in time. As we know, though, it took a very long time for women to continue to fight for their full voting rights. And for Black women, it has taken even that much longer. And so I think it's important to commemorate the milestone, but then to also look ahead and say, you know, what is it that still needs to be done for women and people of color to make sure that we have our full rights in society and our full positions in society so that we are at all places and all levels of decision making in the United States. We have to be represented. Wonderful. Well, you know, I want to touch on one of the big issues I think that you've talked about, uh, and that involves the disproportionate effects of COVID on women in virtually every arena except for mortality rates. You know, whether it's the, the crisis in childcare that many of us are grappling with in this moment, whether it's frontline healthcare workers, whether it's the majority of uh, the job losses that we're experiencing whether it's the fact that women are sort of seemingly absent from the highest levels of these conversations, these global task forces on, on COVID. You wrote a paper for Foreign Affairs magazine last month with recommendations actually on how women could move through this pandemic sort of with greater equity. Why do you think this moment actually is an opportunity and what could a more equitable future for women look like post COVID? Yes, I think the, the COVID has exposed these huge inequities and gaps in our society. So while men are dying at a higher rate, it's the women, though, who are really being disproportionately burdened by COVID. So they are, as you say, the caregivers at home for the young and for the elderly. They are the front lines of our healthcare workers. They're 70% of our healthcare workforce, and they're also a lot of our essential workers. So in our response, we have to design policies that really address these gaps in society. And I think this can be a moment because for so long, you know, our country, our economy has been built on the backs of women's unpaid labor. And there isn't a single, single industrialized nation in the world that doesn't have paid family medical leave policy. And so now that we are seeing our children at home and, and predominantly it's the women trying to keep the schoolwork up, we see the need for um, healthcare workers out in the field who stay healthy. We're seeing the need to get meals and care to the elderly. It finally exposes what's been invisible and makes it visible in our homes. And that's why I'm optimistic that Congress will address this and start to come up with policies for paid leave and sick days. Because if you get COVID or a family member gets COVID, you need to quarantine for 14 days. And you know, one of the first bills that came forward from the first stimulus packages that came forward from Congress took care of some sick days, but not 14. And as well, it didn't cover all essential workers. It didn't cover grocery store workers. And yet they're the ones who are making sure we have food when we go into the stores. So, but I think what's been invisible is now visible to all of us. And that's what makes me optimistic. And I love that it's visible on Zoom screens. I mean, for the first time in our lives, we're all working with the pressures of, you know, small children in our laps or navigating illness at home. I mean, you've written extensively about caregiving, not just in this moment, but beyond. And you wrote an incredible piece about how, you know, to safely reopen this country, we need something more than scaling up testing and engaging in meaningful contact tracing. You know, we need caregiving solutions. I mean, as someone who got an email from her kid's school today saying, my four-year-old is expected to be on Zoom several hours a day with two working parents you know my obligations I'm lucky I'm a person of privilege how do we even begin to solve this for parents and in particular for mothers across the country yes I think you know this is why we need to come up with money for solutions and we need to come up with good policies and so you know those of us who are lucky enough to be doing Zoom calls at home, you just named a lot of the, the struggles and the frustrations. Um, and it is difficult to keep your job up and to care for your children and, and keep a meal on the table. But also think about our families, our, our female workers who are going out and taking a bus to work on public transport. And they're saying, I'm a single mom. Who am I gonna leave my two children with? 
Um, I can't leave them with my mother because she's elderly and she's at risk of COVID. And oh my gosh, the childcare system's closed and maybe there's no school either. So, you know, there are solutions to these things. We can make sure that people understand. We can bolster our child caregiving system to keep people safe so that their kids can go in a safe and healthy way. We can also, there are great solutions out there, even on the internet, where you can search and start to say, okay, what are the childcare options in my neighborhood? How, are they on my bus system? And are they open and are they safe? I mean, if we start to move money to some of these solutions, even online solutions, just to point us in the right information and direction, that will start to change society. There's, there's a great solution also out there for elderly uh, people who need meals or are isolated. You know, you can hook them up with somebody who's a bit younger, who can both go to the pharmacy, get the food, but also connect with them online once a day so they're not so isolated. But we just need to make a commitment to these issues. Amazing. Well, I want to talk about vaccines for a couple of minutes. So you and your husband are obviously at the very forefront of vaccine research and commercialization and delivery in this country, as well as internationally. I know the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has committed more than $300 million to its global COVID-19 um, response since January alone. That's contributing to the rapid development, we hope, of vaccines, of personal protective equipment and therapies. Given your decades of experience in the vaccine realm, uh, Deneen, a viewer in Austin asks, do you have any good news for us? Because <laughs> we can certainly use some in this moment. Uh, you know, what we're seeing is unprecedented collaboration around the world between scientists and pharmaceutical companies and disease modelers. There are brilliant people out there working this problem and working many, many, many strands of it. Everybody working on this knows that the vaccine has to be both safe first for our bodies and efficacious. And so, you know, there are some vaccines that are moving into phase three trials now. That is a very good sign. You don't move a vaccine into phase three trials if you don't have da good data from the previous phases. So, you know, I think those of us who work in this field with these scientists, I think we all believe that by, you know, hopefully first half of next year, there will be a vaccine available. And once we can get it out, and luckily in the United States, we have great delivery systems. Um, once we get it out and we distribute it equitably first to healthcare workers, then to our most vulnerable populations, you'll start to be able to see a return to some normalcy in society. It will take some time but it looks hopeful for early next year. And what are your thoughts on, you know, we're already seeing a lot of disinformation around vaccines. Obviously this has been a, a problem that has plagued this nation for a while, but it feels like it's reaching a fever pitch now as we think about vaccine development. You know, we have a, an administration where the president is tweeting about therapies that are, are questionable potential therapies. How do we battle misinformation, disinformation in a moment where we need to be encouraging people to be looking forward to getting vaccinated? I think, you know, the disinformation, whenever you see it, is uh, disappointing because we know that when people have the facts, that's when they can act best on behalf of their families. So what I say to families is talk to your pediatrician, talk to your doctor, your internal medicine doctor and decide what's right and decide, you know, to talk to them and get the real information. You know, I don't think it's surprising that the disinformation is up, quite honestly, given that people are at home, people are more anxious for good reason about their health. So I do think once a vaccine is out and people start to see that it's helping us return normally in society, I think you'll start to see a lot of that dif disinformation uh, start to go down. So much of your global work has been around systemic change, but change that in many ways starts in people's homes and their communities and their bedrooms and their marriages. You know, teaching husbands about the benefits of family planning for their wives, teaching families about the benefits of prenatal care. You have this brilliant line in your really wonderful book, The Moment of Lift, about how difficult these kinds of teachings are because, quote, their cup is not empty. You can't just pour your ideas into it. I think you were actually quoting another uh, a scholar who'd worked in this arena. I've been thinking a lot about their cup is not empty in this sort of moment of racial reckoning in this country you know, on how we unteach centuries of racism. And I'm curious how you're thinking about this sort of modern day civil rights movement we're living through and, and how we better um, become allies. 
Well, your question, so uh, this book that I wrote, uh, The Moment of Lift that came out last year, really was about what I had learned from talking with so many women and families around the globe from 20 years of travel and the foundation's work. And these women, by sharing their stories and their lives with me, they really called my life to action. And what I learned from these women is they have so much in, in their family life, in their society, so much uh, richness of culture. And yet so often when we go in to help in a way with development, global development or global health, we don't see it that way. And I think we need to redo our thinking and realize, no, you know, if they're asking us for certain tools, then we provide them, such as contraceptives. 200 million women are asking us for contraceptives, which is why I wrote about that in the book. And they're asking us because they want to be able to space the births of their children, because when they can, they know they're healthier, they're less likely to die out in childbirth, their kids are healthier, and they can lift themselves out of poverty. Um, when I look at what's going on with race in our own country, I think, you know, this is a time of reckoning in the United States. And I think that we need to make change in the United States. The data shows us <laughs> we have systemic problems in the United States. And the people who know how to solve some of those problems are people who have lived this journey. And we need to bring their voices forward. They need to have seats at the table where policy is written if we're going to make true change in this country. And I think what lifts me up during this time is, you know, in seeing the protests that you see so many young kids alighted by this um, and marching together arm in arm. Um, so I think, again, COVID has exposed these gaps in society, and I'm actually optimistic that we might finally make some more change. Amazing. Uh, well, speaking of policy, another line that I underlined in your book about 17 different times is that it's the mark of a backward society when decisions are made for women by men. Um, you, you've also written that a lack of federally mandated paid leave is an embarrassing sign of a society that does not value families and does not listen to women. So I just want to ask point blank. Do you believe the United States is a backward society, a society that doesn't value families or listen to women? I think we have progress yet to make in the United States. Until you have a robust paid family medical leave policy, you're not serious about families in this country. So I'm very vocal about that. Um, I also believe that, you know, we need to make sure that women have their full reproductive rights. And so those issues, anytime I see a step backwards, I feel like, ah, we're not making enough progress. And I think we still have a ways to go in this country. Well, you mentioned contraception. A question from Lisa Ivy Miller. Uh, your women's empowerment work really began with family planning and efforts to expand access to contraception. This has obviously been a true labor of love for you for many years. What do you believe the Trump administration has meant for family planning, both at home and abroad? And can family planning ever be depoliticized? Well, I think, you know, we need to look at what every administration does rela related to women's reproductive rights. And what I know is that women deserve to make these decisions about their bodies and their families. And so particularly, my particular concern and that I write about in the book is abroad what it has done by trying to cut the programming, the money that the U.S. provides for contraceptives. <laughs> we are putting women in a situation where of they're going to stay in destitute poverty. There is no country in the world that has made the transition from low to middle income country without first providing contraceptives to families and letting them make the decision for themselves. And women will tell you, and men will tell you, these are decisions we take in our families and that we want to make. And so there's just no reason not to let women make those decisions. And we need to supply different types of contraceptives because women use different ones over the course of their lifetime. And it's one of the tools that begins to lead to empowerment. Yeah. Well, you've written quite a bit about your family planning work being a complicating factor for you and your relationship with your Catholic faith. It's really just a fascinating portion of your book. 
you've obviously over the years been critical about the role of organized religion in some cases holding women back. Um, you write in your book that it's impossible to quantify the damage that's been done to the image of women in the minds of the faithful as they've attended religious services. Back to this idea of sort of their cup isn't empty. How do we make room for women and for women's empowerment in communities of faith? Well, I think we need to start by where people are and what is it that they believe and why do they believe it? You know, society's thinking has changed over time on a whole host of issues. And often it's a religious institution that changes last. And so I think helping people understand what I know to be true is that when people understand their rights and they understand their body, they start to question society around them. And so quite often, you need to make sure that people are educated. We know that educated men and women start to make different decisions for themselves and their families. And so I do believe it starts with education and education about their rights and their bodies, and then more of an academic education. And that's what will change society and change norms. Uh, lots of audience questions have come in about your sort of personal familial take on gender equity. Um, another thing that you wrote in your book is that until 2006, you didn't really focus on gender equity as a foundation. And even then that you, Melinda Gates, like the, you know, the, the godmother of women's empowerment, sort of tiptoed around the issue, grappling with gender equity in your own marriage and your own family in the workplace until you sort of really came out swinging in 2014 and 2015. If it was a challenge for you, what message does that send to the other women, I think, who are grappling with this at home and at work? Well, I think we have to all look at what have we been up against in society, whether it was when you were a young girl or middle school or high school or college or beyond. You know, society constantly gives us these messages. And I think we're all up against those messages. And then sometimes we're up against those messages in our own homes or in our own schools or in our own workplaces. And so what I would say to all women is you need to examine what is it you believe about women and why do you believe that? And even question it. Question it for yourself. If you have a daughter, question it for your daughter. Question it for your son. How does your son treat women? What, how do you want him to treat women? And I think it's only when we start to look inward and wrestle with these issues that we start to say, hmm, Am I as far as I would like to be as a woman in either making sure I'm empowered or making sure those around me are empowered? And it took me some time to come to that. Um, and partly, again, it was my travels around the world, meeting so many women in these rural settings or in local communities in Nairobi and hearing their stories. And I would think, oh, I'd be on my way home. I wish they were more empowered. And then when I turned the question back on myself, and said, how empowered am I? How empowered are women in the United States? I started to realize we weren't as far along as I thought maybe we were or I would like us to be. And that's why I decided that I would actually use the platform I have to stand up on behalf of women. Amazing. Well, you were talking about, about women in the workplace and another, I think, you know, I'm a mother of a four-year-old girl. Another line in your book that made me stop in my tracks was that today we are sending our daughters into workplaces that were designed for our dads. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yes. I mean, today of most married couples, both parents work. And yet society hasn't caught up to that notion. Society is still, our economy is still built as if the man is going off to work and the woman is staying home. And so until we address those issues, we address leave days, we address uh, family leave, we address sick days. You know, it's so often is the woman who's expected if the child is sick at school to go pick the child up, leave the workplace and go get the child. But if she has no sick days to do that, or we don't encourage men to take sick days um, for their themselves or their families, that's why it's got to be family leave. You can't expect the woman to do it all. But unless we address those issues, we really haven't created the workplace um, in a way that will work for families and single moms and single dads. So what are the countries that we should be modeling? Because obviously you travel all over the world and I think something that I found so interesting about you is that you find what works in all of these different countries. You write about it, you, you make comparisons. 
who should we be modeling ourselves on? Who's doing it exactly right or close to it? Yeah, I don't think there's anybody doing exactly right uh, because I think we're all learning and, and changing over time. But the countries I look to are the Nordic countries, you know, Sweden and Norway. They have been at this since after World War II. You know, women went into the workforce during the war, just like in the United States. But then they created the right policies and women stayed in the workforce, whereas that didn't happen in the United States. Women actually went back to the home and decided, okay, we're going to raise the kids. But they put a lot of the right policies in place and they have amazing caregiving systems, preschools. So they basically have realized we have two working parents and how do we support them so both he and she can do their jobs. When I was in Sweden just last year, uh, which seems like a lifetime ago now, um, but I was on a panel and the, with some men and they were horrified that we didn't have paid family medical leave in the United States because they said, I'm a man. I expect to take care of my kids when they're young. I want to be part of taking care of my kids. Of course, I take that leave when I get it so that I'm a part of the child's life from the beginning and then we're doing it together. And again, when you think of how many years they've been at this, that's why it's just a completely different norm in society than what we have in the United States. How do you think about the United States position in the world right now, you know, as a world leader right now? I mean, I think a lot of us have been grappling with this sort of fallibility question, looking at the United States' response to the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, looking at, at, you know, how states continue to surge. I think a lot of people are having this moment of uh, questioning of, you know, uh, are we living in a first world country? Are we, is this a place that can respond? Tell me how you think about the United States in the global sphere in this moment. Well, I look at the numbers. I look at the amount of disease of COVID uh, numbers, and I look at the deaths in the United States. And you hold those numbers up compared to Europe or some of the Asian countries or several others, and you can tell we are not doing well. And what I know to be true is that it is because of a failure of leadership. The other countries did the right things. We don't have many tools right now. What we have are social distancing, masks, contact tracing, isolation and quarantine. But other countries took the leadership to make sure that right when it hit their country, even when the numbers were skyrocketing, that they use the tools at their disposal and they use them on a nationwide basis. Because we didn't do that uh, in the United States with leadership and we didn't empower the CDC, which is an amazing organization set up when it was set up to advise health uh, county counties on what to do, health commissioners, because we didn't empower them, we didn't have a national response. And so our leadership is lacking and it's why you're seeing so much death in the United States. And that is really disappointing. Well, you know, I'm going to ask you about this leadership. You and your husband have not traditionally endorsed candidates, though it's been abundantly clear that you are wildly unimpressed with the current administration, including giving Trump a D minus for his coronavirus response. Will you be endorsing in this election cycle? You know, we're still discussing that, but I we've always been a bipartisan organization. In fact, right now, we are working on the Hill with Republicans and Democrats about the next stimulus bill and saying what we see, what we think is needed for vaccine even outside the country. And so it's important that people understand, you know, we work so well with the Bush administration. We worked really well with the Obama administration. We're going to work with whoever the next administration is. So it's up to us to make sure people understand that what we are about are the issues, keeping people safe and healthy and giving them the best chance at a productive life. And that's who we are as a couple, and that's what we're about. And so I'm not sure who we vote for is, is really going to be the thing that, that matters. We're not gonna swing the election. It's how we do our work with the leadership that's there. And have you, you said you've worked with all these past administrations. Have you all been able to work or break into the Trump administration at all? We have worked some with the Trump administration, absolutely, um, over time. And we've also voiced our disappointment and our displeasure. 
Most of our work, though, is on the Hill because luckily it is Congress that disposes the money, both in terms of stimulus packages and foreign aid. Um, so that's where we continue to put our most energy and effort. Would you like to see a first female vice president? I'd like to see a first female president in my lifetime. And then, yes, of course, I want a female vice president. And obviously, I'm looking at the candidates closely, and I'm uh, excited about what might come forward there. Great. Well, we just have about one minute left here. So I guess I would ask, you know, how long do you think until we're going to see a female president? I don't think any of us know the answer to that, but I definitely think it will be in my lifetime. And I think the fact that you see so many young people, you know, I do see more young people, the way they're working as couples in society or backing one another up at home or taking on this uh, unpaid leave, you know, they're starting to expect something different and they represent more of who we are sometimes as a society and where we want to be. So I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll get one in my lifetime. There are so many credible female candidates out there, and um, I think you'll see more come forward. But it's why we need to put more money behind female candidates. It's hard for them to raise money. And, you know, you do have to have money to, to do even in a local election. So it's why we have to move money and voice behind them. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Melinda Gates, for everything you do in this arena. And thank you so much for being part of the 19th Represents. Thanks for having me, Emily. It is a little difficult to navigate as a woman in business. And I think the best way to get through it is just to be aware of the differences and be yourself. For me, how I found how to navigate through that is I just had to be more confident in myself and be more confident in my accolades. It's a very enriching thing to be connected with other women in business. Just hearing other women's stories really just made it more achievable. Here, I style my life around hard work and growth. Every day, I put my best foot forward and make a statement. Thanks to incredible mentors, I've had the opportunity to work on several teams at the heart of the financial markets. It's because of these great relationships I'm able to empower others. I'm here because we go further when we support each other along the way. Next up, I'm pleased to introduce the artist and women's empowerment activist, Madam Gandhi, who recently toured for Oprah on her 2020 Vision Stadium tour, has been listed as a Forbes 30 Under 30 member, and is a 2020 TED Fellow. Madam Gandhi will perform, The Future is Female. Hi everyone, I'm Madam Gandhi, visiting you from downtown LA. I'm super happy to hold space with you, and I support and I'm grateful for the 19th. Uh, this November, may we all be uh, so bold as, and so brave as to research issues that matter to us, understand uh, the folks who we're voting for and their positions. Um, may we take time ahead of the election to put energy and enthusiasm into knowing uh, about the different folks who are running and, and what they stand for. Uh, and may we understand how our vote directly affects um, our own communities and our own neighborhood. 
So thank you again uh, to the 19th for holding space, for getting uh, us to encourage more women to run and to, and to be in office and, and folks of different gender identities and, uh, and queer folks and folks of color and also folks of different abilities uh, as well. Um, I'm Madam Gandhi. I, I feel very passionate about gender liberation and this song I'd like to play for you today is called The Future is Female. Wherever you are, I hope you'll vibe with me. Hey. Listen, I heard Amy Poehler speak at the White House. Her words hit me hard like a light bulb. Fictitious dub fictions of girls must die out. If we want to live in a world that triumphs, I am just talking about loving the femme. I ain't talking about nobody else. Toxic masculinity has to end. I'm just talking about loving ourselves. You can catch me singing these words in a yellow other wild futurist female t-shirt like a me i got something to say gender construction just get in the way i've been playing drums as i go to eight the future is female the future is great Sing it with me. The future is female. Yeah. The future is female. The future is collaborative. The future is queer. The future is of color. The future is joyful. The future is intelligent. Listen, power in what you say. In what you say, on your voice, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, there's power in what you say. In what you say, on your voice, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, yeah, yeah. What's up, the 19th? Hope y'all are good. How could girly ever be an insult? All the women I know are ones moving culture. What would happen if we all would leave with a little less aggression, more femininity? We have to value girls more than our looks. The biggest threat is a girl with a book. The system must make room for all that we do. We've been bleeding each month till we gave birth to you. To me, the future is female means that no longer will female qualities be subordinated to male qualities. I want to live in a world that is collaborative, a world that is emotionally intelligent, a world in which we are linked and not ranked. The future is female. The future is female. Yeah, sing it with me. Yeah. The future is female. Listen. In what you say, in what you say, on your voice, don't be afraid, don't be afraid, there's power in what you say, in what you say, on your voice, don't be afraid, don't be afraid, the future is female, mm, yeah, the future is female, I can't hear you, I can't hear you, one, two, three, chime in. The future is female. Yeah. The future is female. The future is female. Yeah. The future is queer. The future is feminine. The future is collaborative. You know. For me, it's been incredible to see so much of the leadership um, this entire year really live in the femme, you know, no matter what the gender identity is of the of the person leading, you know, things like being um, tender and focusing on healing and focusing on being the best versions of ourselves and being the best countries that we can be and being the best leaders that we can be and optimizing for people's health and well-being rather uh, than sort of corporate and greedy goals. 
may we all uh, be so brave as to dig into whom we are voting for. May we vote for leaders who exhibit unique and other and alternative styles of leadership that we haven't quite yet seen. And thanks again um, to the 19th for all the incredible work uh, you are doing. Cheers. I'm Madam Gandhi visiting you from downtown LA, and thanks for having me. Next up, we are going to hear from women who are working to shake up the Republican Party, including congressional candidates Young Kim of California, Beth Van Dyne of Texas, and Valerie Ramirez Mukherjee of Illinois. Let's pass the baton to the moderators of this conversation, Sarah Longwell, the president and CEO of Longwell Partners and the publisher of The Bulwark. I'm Sarah Longwell. Welcome to our conversation about uh, the future of the Republican Party and the women who are going to help build it. Uh, I am joined today by Valerie Ramirez Mukherjee uh, and by uh, Mayor Beth Van Dyne. Thank you both. Unfortunately, um, young Kim uh, just informed us just now that she's unable to join due to illness. Um, so we are sending her our best wishes for a speedy recovery. Uh, okay, so jumping right in. I want to talk to you guys about a very weird dynamic that's taking place right now in the election. So there's this dominant narrative about how women are abandoning the Republican Party. Uh, and it's true to some degree, right? Joe Biden has this historic advantage, at least if the polling's right, over Donald Trump. Um, and yet, yet, the Republican Party has seen a record number of women running for office. Uh, in fact, it is double. So a decade ago, there was a record set where 133 women filed to run for Congress. This year, Republican women, there were 217 who filed to run for Congress. So on one hand, it feels like women are kind of saying no to the Republican Party. On the other hand, they're running at historic numbers. Why do you think that is? And I'm going to start with the mayor. Um, you know, I don't know that I see women leaving the Republican Party, quite honestly, especially in the last five months where we have seen such, such chaos in major cities across the country. I think the reason why you see more women running is you're actually seeing more women get support to run. Um, you know, deciding to run for office is a tough thing. I, you know, my, I ran for office the first time when I was in my early 30s. My kids were two and five. And you know, that's a, it was a lot of responsibility, but I got a ton of support to do it. And I think we've, we're, we're starting to see that around the country. I think the Republican Party has recognized that when they look in the mirror, you know, the reflection is not necessarily what you see in the rest of the country. And I know for a fact the last year that the, the party and general leadership has really done a great deal of work in recruiting top notch candidates that I think are more reflective of the diversity across the country. But you know, I, I reject a little bit the notion that women are fleeing from the Republican Party because you know, I, I represent, I will represent hopefully a very diverse district um, in North Texas that is, is heavily suburban. And I've been talking to these women for years, you know, first as council member for six years, as mayor for six years, working as part of the administration under Secretary Carson at HUD for two and a half years. I've talked to these women. And at the end of the day, what they're looking for is what's in the best interest for their families uh, long term. And I think that's that's a strong economy, that's uh, safe streets and neighborhoods, and it's you know wonderful educational opportunities. And I see that coming much stronger from the Republican Party than from the Democrat Party. Yeah. So, I, and I understand wanting to push back on that, but like, isn't it yeah. true, right, that Joe Biden sort of leads right now? The last number I saw, he's plus twenty three uh, against Donald Trump with women. You, you don't think that there's some reason that that's the case? You know, I have heard, you know, that you've got women who are clutching their pearls and don't like the president's personality. But I would argue that if we stop thinking about women as, you know, emotional beings and we start looking at them, as I always have, as people who are, are very direct um, and who are looking at policy over personality, I think that there's really only one answer in this election, and that will be to vote conservative, and that will be to vote Republican. You know, we're looking at border security, we're looking at health care options, we're looking at, you know, what's in the best interest of, of the economy moving forward long term. And I think, you know, those things all feed into the Republican Party and the party, let's face it, is larger than one personality. Yeah, Valerie, go ahead. What, same I question. I have a difference yeah, of opinion. So as I've said on TV, I feel like, you know, a lot of Republican women have gone into hiding, right? So I talk about how... <laughs> 
And I was that 18, 19 year old that didn't really, didn't know what a Democrat or Republican was, but picked up the phone to try to, try to you know, get involved in my civic kind of involvement when I took a political science class in, in, in college is uh, I was a part of a, a moderate, you know, party back in the 90s. Like I have pictures behind me with John Kasich as who was, you know, I know he just went on TV last night, but back in the 90s, he was a star, right? I have pictures with, uh, you know, Newt Gingrich with Jack Kemp. So people that were, we had a variety in our party. We had your moderate wing, we had your conservative wing, and we accepted both. I went out, worked in, you know, got some degrees, worked in business, stepped back in, and I said, wait, where did everyone go? Where did all the moderates go? I didn't know that I went extinct. So then I call my buddies. I call my girlfriends from business school, from grad school, from other places. And, and they tell me, you know, the reason why I'm purple, so I got purple signs there, purple there, is when you look at our electorate and a lot of the women, they are in that middle. They're that centrist, not all. Again, I'm not stereotyping. It's not who I am. But a lot are in that middle. And it's, they used to be center right, and then they've chosen to go center left. My opinion, one reason why I'm running, is I think we can get them back to go center right for all the reasons that Beth just said. But I do think they went into hiding. I do think they're out there. And I do think we have a chance to rebuild and to prove ourselves again, to show who we are. Yeah, well, you, you raise uh, a question that I wanted to ask you both. And frankly, I get asked it all the time too. I think, you know, all of us are Republicans here, uh, but we represent perhaps all different strains of Republicans. Uh, and as we know, you know, Ronald Reagan built us a big tent. Uh, it's possible that that tent is fracturing somewhat uh, in this moment, but why don't we just, I'm interested in why, uh, even though I hate, I hate it when people ask me this question, so I'm just gonna ask it to you anyway. Uh, but, but Beth, why are you a Republican? What made you a Republican? <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I've always considered myself a pragmatist above, above anything else. Um, and when I was elected official for, you know, when I was mayor for six years, when I was on city council for six years, those were nonpartisan positions. You know, you didn't have to declare what party you were and the elections were even were even held separate on, you know, separate times of the year. Um, so, so why am I a Republican? I look at it, the values that we hold. And I think of, of being um, fiscally conservative. I think of being fiscally responsible. I think of, of you know, the, the purpose of government should be very limited, but the purpose should really be, the focus should be on, on preserving uh, individual rights. So when I start thinking about things that, that Republicans hold and what, what the party has, has fought for and what we've seen in the last three years from its administration, things like a focus on jobs, a focus on making people accountable, um, a focus on, on border security, but really allowing the private sector to have as much ability to be able to provide and those people ability to, to have an opportunity um, to be able to provide for themselves self-sufficiency programs. Um, when I look at the, the two parties, I look at one being more of a rule of law, and I look especially in the last five months, and I look at the other as being a party of chaos. And I think it's it's pretty it's fairly black and white. You know, you were talking about the the, the women who are moving on the left side, but I think really what's happened to the Democrat Party is it's been hijacked. It's been hijacked for people who are on the very far left. It's been hijacked by people who are promoting a socialist agenda. And I think, you know, the options right now in a, in a race, yeah, we want to have our center right, we want to have our moderate right, we want to have far right so that we are a very diverse a party that includes everybody. But at the same token, I just see the folks who are, on, who are running on the Democrats to all be running to the far left. And it's, it's no longer even capitalism, it's no longer even America, it's people who believe in America on the right and people who seem to hate and, and, and fight everything that America stands for on the left. You know, um, I, I, I could agree on some level that I think, you know, the Democrats are pushing far left. I could also argue that Republicans are pushing far right. But I do think when you talk about the Democrats being hijacked, uh, you know, there was, there was this insurgency, right, by Bernie Sanders. The same way almost there was yeah. this insurgency by Donald Trump in 2016 where he ran against, you know, all of the people that I thought were the future of the party, Marco Rubio, Jeb Bush, Scott Walker, uh, and Donald Trump managed to actually hijack the party, a guy who identified as a Democrat for much of his life, uh, whereas yeah. <laughs> Biden, who, you know, basically ran as, except for Mike Bloomberg, the most centrist of the Democratic nominees. And definitely, I listened to those Democratic primary debates, and I heard some things that, that uh, made the, back of the, the hair on the back of my neck stand up. But I also watched Joe Biden, uh, you know, talk about the Constitution, uh, talk about, you know, sort of politics in this 
uh, way where he wasn't going in for Medicare for all. He certainly was uh, wasn't acting like a socialist. So how is it that where where the Democrats have managed to hold off their insurgency and nominate what was their sort of most moderate candidate? Why is it that you sort of talk about them? Because I checked out your Twitter. You you talk about the Democrats as socialists a lot. Do you think that's yeah. Do you think that sticks to somebody like Joe Biden? Well, I think it, there's a huge difference. And, and if we didn't learn this in 2016 and 2018, there's a huge difference about what you say, and especially what you say on the campaign trail, and what you actually vote for and stand for when you're elected. And I think when you see people who are pushing the Medicare for all, all we heard was, look, we're going to be independents. We're, we're not going to be beholden to a party. When we get into office, we're going to be able to work across the, or work across the aisle. We're going to work with Republicans. We're going to work with independents. We're going to bring solutions forward like health care. What have you seen? You know, from the, from the, when I say far left, all I've seen since they took office in 2018, all of these people who said they were going to be moderates and they were going to work, the only focus that I have seen is to destroy a president. Now, like him or not, there's policies that you have to, as, as, as a conservative, as an American, that you have to agree with. Border security, having fair trade agreements across the country, a focus again on the economy and bringing jobs back from places like China, looking at national security and being upset when you see places like China that are taking intellectual property, but they're actually, I mean, you look at what, what's happened with COVID. I mean, if we had, for example, open borders to the South and we hadn't been concentrating on that, imagine if this, this pandemic had started in Mexico, for example. All of those things are important. And I see people say different things um, when they are campaigning and then completely proving, proving themselves wrong when they take office. And it, it, people are sick of it. They're looking for people who are going to be able to provide solutions, who are pragmatic, who are willing to work with other adults in the room, leave their ego at the door. And that's on both sides of the aisle. But that to me is what people are looking for. And the far extremists too, you know, that man bad um, and everything that we're doing good and we don't want to hear another opinion. I think people are sick of it. Uh, women and men, I think right. Americans are just sick of that. Yeah, I will continue to have this, but I want to let, uh, I want to let yeah. Val go yes. back. I'm dying to jump in because one thing I <laughs> is this is where I say we are coming out of our 25-year fight. So we have figured out that we have a variety of people in our party. Our tent is big. It wasn't big for the last, I'd say, 10 or so years. But I think we've learned because how do you learn? You don't learn from your successes. You learn from your failures, right? That's how I, that's how I live my life. I, I remember my failures. Take your successes for granted, right? So I look at this, and again, I go back to an opportunity. The reason why I stepped out of my business career with my young kids, like Beth, I'm, you know, I have young kids at home, uh, in the peak of my earning career to say, this is our chance. We are coming out of this 25-year fight as a party, and we have finally learned we have to support the conservative that fits that district and the moderate that fits the district that I'm running for. And this is where I see the Democrats, they're going to have to figure out their 25-year fight now. So yes, do I agree? that you're, that you're having the progressives and we're seeing it in New York and other places where the progressive is challenging that Democrat moderate candidate and the moderates getting kicked out. So I look at this and this is one reason why I decided to run. This is our time. This is our chance to rebuild as a party, to learn from our failures, to embrace, to make the tent big again as the Democrat party goes into their 25 year fight, right? And hopefully it's gonna be led by women like us. Yeah, I do want it. Yeah, I, I wanted I wanted to comment though on the on 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 the extremists though. If you look at cities across the country, we don't have to imagine what would happen under Democrat rule. Look at places like Seattle, like Portland, like Minneapolis, like Atlanta, look Chicago, where you have Democrats in office that are completely throwing their police departments and rule of law under the bus. You've got Democrat DAs that are letting criminals out. And yet you've got prosecutors that are arresting people who want to go back to work. You've got people who are talking Democrat leaders who are talking about defunding police officers as people are being murdered in the street because police aren't able to do their job. If that is not an extremist agenda that everybody seems to be jumping on the bandwagon on the front on the far left, I don't know what is. That's that that is not the creating that where it's not imagining it. All you have to do is turn on the TV or open up a newspaper and you're seeing that under Democrat rule every day. Yeah, although, you know, the people, I, I mean, I've seen these ads, right? It's like, oh, this is what will happen in Joe Biden's America. But this is Donald Trump's America. This stuff's happening in Donald Trump's America. And a lot of these 
you know, protests, which, yeah, when you see looting and rioting, it is incredibly, you know, discomforting and you want somebody to do something about it. But sending in DHS, you know, the federal government with unmarked uh, officers kind of dragging people off the street, that might be exacerbating things potentially. Well, I think when your kids are getting murdered and police aren't able to go and help them, I think that's a little bit more exasperating. Yeah, but when also I'm my 75 year old mom saying, I finally want to get a gun, or my brother who was on the far left yep. side saying, I finally <laughs> want to get a gun. That's when I sat back and said, wow, right? So I get yeah. it. And this is where I say, we are fighting as a country. Now we need to heal. And we have an opportunity yeah. to heal. We have an opportunity. And the, that, that progressive wing, that voice is there. I, I respect those and their opinions. I may not agree with their opinions, but that faction of the Democratic Party is out there. They're not going away. Their voice is getting bigger. Their following is getting bigger. And as that, as I draw kind of my bell curve and I go to my far left extreme on the Democrat side, I say, they're gonna get larger. And as they get larger, they're gonna put pressure on that moderate. So the Joe Biden and others, they're gonna say, I need you to do this, because if you don't, my people aren't voting for you. If my people don't vote for you, that person over there is gonna win. That conversation that we as a Republican party have had for the last, again, 25 years is starting. And this is where I say, Beth, all of those things, yeah, it's going to get that centrist person again to say, wait, do I want to choose? What do I want to do? I have a vote. I got to decide. But let me make sure that I have a Republican who is center right. Maybe, you know, if you have the center, the, the, the far right, you already have that vote, right? But we're trying to say, how do you capture that middle part of the bell curve, which is the highest? And this is where I see this election. Hopefully voters will become educated, will learn, and they will choose. If it's not now, it will come. That's my prediction. Hey, Valerie, I'm, I'm interested in this uh, because I, I love I love a good moderate Republican. That's like my speed. Uh, but I got to say, like, moderate Republicans are being run out of this party on the rails right now. And you're right. Part of it is because uh, because national politics are dictating certain um, trends. So you see people, uh, a lot of the moderates in 2018, for example, you know, sort of got wiped out by moderate Democrats. Um, and so I actually... And I just have to push back on this because I'm just talking about what I see, but I look at people like Abigail Spanberger and Alyssa Slotkin uh, and a bunch of the women who, who won in 2018 who ran very much in red districts or, or sort of purple districts, but, but places that were slightly redder, places that went for Trump by six points or so, like they were able to win. Uh, and I'm worried that actually it's been easier for there to be moderate Democrats these days than it is for there to be moderate Republicans. You don't, but you're telling me the opposite. You're saying that, no, 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 this is the universe as we're just getting started with a, with a lot more room for moderate Republicans. But I just, I gotta say, I worry, and we can have this conversation in more depth, that like if I was looking forward to 2024, that I'd see a party that was more reflective potentially of Tucker Carlson than Larry Hogan, for example. But tell me why I'm wrong. Okay, so one thing I try to say is blue state Republicans. So you have red state Republicans or blue state Republicans, right? So when I look at my state, Illinois, or California where I've lived, those are blue state, you know, you have blue state Republicans. When I was in politics, again, working for my congressman in the 90s, we had Republicans. They were there. They represented, you know, the governorship. They represented my congressman. They, they were there. But somehow we went on that seesaw where we, we went the complete opposite direction. We used to be kind of balanced, and now we're like this, right? So as I look now, what I'm, what I'm finding, and let's look at my race. Let's look at my race here in Congressional District 10. The party got behind me early. They helped make sure that nobody ran against me because they knew that if a, if a far right person ran against me in the primary, I would have never gotten through. No way. I would have not gotten through the primary. And that's what my brother and others would say to me. Now you can't get, you're not going to be on the general election. A far right candidate will win in the primary and you won't get through. So I remember checking constantly, like, is this someone going to run against me? Or, but my party got behind me. Just three weeks ago, someone on the far right tried to run against me. My party got behind me. They don't agree with me 100%. They are more conservative than I am, but they don't care. They said, she represents our district. She represents, they're the hiring managers in a way, encouraging, bringing talent to the voters. And they got to decide, is this the person that can win in the general or do we want that person who makes us feel really good, but we know when they get to general, they can't win. And this is where I say our parties are changing, right? The leadership is changing to embrace that and they're getting smarter. We've learned from our failures. Yeah, although, you know, actually, since you brought up your district, it's worth providing some context on your district because it's, it's, it's a super interesting district, long held uh, by a famous moderate in Mark Kirk. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't remember the guy's name who replaced, Dold, Dold, Dold. right? Mm -hmm. Dold replaced him. Uh, 
and then and then he gets beaten he goes back and forth right he wins and then loses and then wins again uh or sorry loses anyway it went back and forth uh with him winning, and winning to the point where now a democrat holds the seat brad someone held yeah. it for four years right so he's had it for four years so, yeah so it's like it's like this perfect purple district that goes back and forth between Republican and it seems to have a lot to do with what's happening at the national level and how many people vote. Um, and so how are you uh, in this environment? Because this is something I wanted to ask. I, I want to ask both of you is with national politics has become so dominant in the way that people even think about politics. So when you're somebody running for Congress, how do you kind of define yourself distinct from the party, especially if you're running uh, in a district that is so purple like yours is, Valerie? So for, for what I say to people is our district has fundamentally changed. Uh, so 91 in the last 100 years has been represented by Republicans. So first I tell people when the media says, can't win that, I go, what are you talking about? Look at history, right? So sure, you've redrawn some lines, but then let's, lay, let's, let's go down to the mayor level. Most of the mayors in the district across the district are Republican. So the voters that are turning out split their tickets, right, from the top of the ticket as they go down. Uh, and so when I looked at the district, I just said, we're not running the right person. So over time, over the last 10 years, the district is now approaching almost 50% minority. A large amount of that being Hispanic. I'm Hispanic. A large percentage of that being Asian. My husband's Asian. So as I reach out to the voters, who I say, again, Republicans in hiding, right, and I talk to a lot of the Hispanics or, and or the Asians, they realize, they go, well, as we talk about values, I don't tell my party, I'm purple, right? They assume oftentimes like she's a Democrat, so they talk to me. And then as we talk about issues, I go, you know, those are Republican values. Did you realize that? And they're like, no, didn't know Republican values, didn't know that. I thought that I was supposed to be a Democrat. And what I get so inspired by is I have those conversations, just like I did 25 years ago, and I didn't know what a Democrat or Republican was, but I knew my working class area was represented predominantly by Democrats. I have people that their ears are open now, so they're listening to me. Right? Is it going to take long? Is, am I having a lot of conversations each day with voters trying to explain to them and educate them? Yes. But the beauty is their ears are open. Their ears weren't open before. So Bob Dole, fantastic. He got a lot of stuff done in the few, time, the few cycles he was there. But he didn't fit the district anymore. Right? He, the district has evolved. Uh, so this is why when, again, the party, you know, I got involved, they said we're behind her 100%. And the voters, uh, it's been phenomenal, my conversations I'm having. Do you think because it's been getting more purple even slightly bluer do you think that being a woman provides you does it does it help at all does it matter at all how do you think about that you know i don't and this is where i you know i've said before and, and i sit back because i had a conversation with a, a woman who was a democrat um who was you know saying that she felt uncomfortable that i talked about me as as a woman i said that's who i am like i can't change this right that's how i was born she was uncomfortable <laughs> that uh that i was talking about you know, biracial my kids are triracial and I said again just a fact I didn't choose that right like uh, that's how how that's how my mom chose it's how I chose my husband and and so I sit back and say judge me on my resume first so before you do anything go look at my resume see what I've accomplished see where I came from see what I've accomplished step one check am I am I qualified ask me that first second ask if being a woman representing this district, do I get a pers give a perspective that maybe those in this district have never had before, right? Being a minority, does that give a perspective or a story? And I say this word perspective all the time and I overuse it. But when I'm sitting there, you know, representing them in Congress, will I understand the story of so many of our district that have never been represented, right? They've never had a voice. Like to be on the ballot, I'm the first woman on the general election ballot here, I think ever first minority woman, right? And if I'm if elected, I'll be the first Hispanic American woman to represent Illinois in the US Congress. Yet the state of Illinois is 35% Hispanic. So, but I sit back and say, those, and that inspires me. And the calls I get excite me, keeps me going when I get the calls of people that are super mean to me, right? But they inspire me. Uh, but I say, I always start with, please judge me on my, what I've done with my life and where my starting line was and where I came from and where I am today. Judge me there first. All right. Beth, I want to, uh, Mayor, uh, Mayor Beth. Beth. good, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I want to talk your district a little bit, because your district is pretty interesting uh, in the sense, so A, it's an open seat, you're running against uh, a woman, your Democratic opponent's a woman, uh, but it's one of those, so Texas is also, though, going through some demographic shifts, uh, and so your district, I believe Romney won it by 60%, 
Trump won it at 50%. Hillary Clinton got like 44%. Um, but obviously it's continued to shift. Um, actually, I want to ask you, a, 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 I'm sorry to make you guys engage in rank punditry with me, but you know, I've got you here. So wow. do you think that the Democrats have any chance of taking Texas, Beth? No, absolutely not. I think especially what's given what's happened in the last five months, um, I, just just from a practical standpoint, I, you know, Valerie was mentioning earlier, um, you know, the Second Amendment issues and where that might have been a, a, a conversation point with suburban moms across the district. What I've seen is people who were questioning on, on the expansion of, uh, of, of more restrictions on Second Amendment rights are now actually going out and purchasing guns for the first time because they're scared about what's going on in their own backyard. You know, your point about this being a very diverse district, you know, when I was mayor of Irving, Irving had the most diverse zip code in the country. Yes, it's a very changing demographic. I was down in Midland uh, last week with, uh, with, with the president and with Governor Abbott and Governor Perry. And Governor Perry and I were reminiscing about the time when he was governor and we were fighting to get all these um, all these businesses to move to Texas. And we were very good at it. Um, you know, we, we saw companies like McKesson and Toyota move here from California. And they were like, maybe we're too good at it because the demographics are changing. But, you know, at the same token, I think it's our job uh, to explain why we are the best candidates. Um, I have never run and asked anybody to support me because I was a woman. I was the only woman who has ever been mayor of the city of, of Irving. Uh, Irving, just to give you an idea, is one of the 100 largest cities in the country, 250,000 people, seven Fortune 500 companies, including ExxonMobil. Uh, the airport's right, you know, DFW airport's right in the middle of it. Very diverse district. But I've never asked anybody to support me because I'm a woman. Support me because I'm the best candidate, because I have a vision that you believe in, because I'm effective, and because I'm actually willing to put the work in to get the job done. And you know, when, it, when we say, are we running on a party platform, I'm running on my experience and what I've been able to achieve. And you know, as an elected official, as having worked with, with folks um, across the state, across the country, you know, for nearly two decades now, you know, what I've been able to achieve when we were mayor is fastest growing, one of the fastest growing areas, one of the fastest growing cities in the country. We had one of the best economic periods our city has ever had in our history. We were, had the lowest crime rate in our city's history, fifth safest city in the country, those are the things that I'm running on. We were able to pass an ethics policy that limited campaign contributions, that talked about term limits for the first time ever in our city's history. And you know, I was the only woman on the city council for quite a long time. And I was when I was mayor, I was the only woman that was on there. But it's funny, people didn't look at me like that. In fact, it was a joke that I was more male than most of the male my male colleagues. Mm -hmm. um, Nothing, by the way, that I thought was, was proud about that. I always kind of make me laugh because I always thought, you know, women have a lot more, uh, a, a lot more work to do to prove themselves. But, you know, the fact is, I think you need to run on, on what you've done and what you can, can do. And it's not just campaign promises, but look at what has been achieved and how you've done it in the past. And it doesn't necessarily mean have, having ever held, you know, elected office before. But do you have a voice and do you have a backbone? And I think that's what's really missing in Congress right now is people who are willing to put the work in to get the job done. They have a list of talking points that they can go in front of, you know, whatever news station, you know, fits their, fits their, 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 their spice for that day. But it's much different when you have to talk to people, work behind the scenes to get this stuff done. It takes a lot of time. It's a lot of time away from your family. It's a lot of time away from your career. Um, and, and, and politics shouldn't be a career, right? Um, it should be servant's heart, and that's why you're doing it. Those are the things I think we need to focus on. I'm sorry? Everyone says that when they're getting into politics. No, you don't hear it. Which is why, after I've been in it for as long as I have, don't, you know, it's not just a talking point. Look at what I've been able to achieve. Yeah. You're laughing at that, Sarah. I have this book. It's called Restoring the Dream or the Contract with America. Because that's when I got involved in Republican politics. It was like 92, 93, 94. It was, ex it was super cool to be a Republican. And that was one of their, uh, you know, the, the freshman Republican class wanted to bring term limits. But 80% of Republicans voted for it, then just 20% of Democrats, it, they were not able to get the amendment. So one thing I've told people is, I don't need, you know, Congress, I don't need a law to tell me what's right. If I'm elected, I'm only going to serve eight years. After eight years, this is a really hard job. The one year that I've been running for this, like, this is way harder than anything I experienced in Wall Street or in Silicon Valley Tech. Like, this is hard. Right, and, and it wears on your emotions. So I said, if I'm in eight years, after eight years, I'm leaving. If there's an, even if there isn't term limits, I'll hold myself accountable to term limits. Okay, Beth, what about you? You do eight year commitment? I, I, I will say, 
you know, I, I look at it. Yeah, I was on city council for six years and I, I've, I've, I've run for office now six times. I've never lost, I've le never lost a race. Um, me, but after six years, after two terms, I stepped down. And as mayor, as after two terms, I stepped down. That's perfect because she's going through different roles. So it would be no different than working at a tech company, right? Yes. You're, you're varying it to different roles and different responsibilities. So that's what I say. Eight years in any one role for me personally. Got it. But Beth, you're trying it. You're, you're, you're looking to, to keep kind of climbing, climbing the ladder here, right? You were mayor, now you're running you for know. Congress. Yeah, I've never actually looked at it as a ladder. It's it's kind of funny. I, I look at it as, you know, what is, in, everything is about timing. And and for me, the timing worked out. You know, Kenny Marchin has held the seat for 16 years. I was well known in my district. Um, I had been president of our of our Republican Women's Club for, for three years. I knew the people in the party. I knew the people in the neighborhoods. I knew the pl people in the places of worship. Um, and, and in leadership. I mean, it's one of the reasons why when I, when I ran early on, we had a five-way primary. But early on in the primary, I was able to get the, the um, endorsement and the support of the majority of mayors and city council members and sheriffs um, and other elected officials in the district because I've worked with them for this long. So I, I've never really looked at this as what, what are you doing next? And, and I, it's, it's so funny because people don't really think that. But I, this is something that I do because I'm passionate about it and, and I have a servant's heart. But you know, as far as what, what, what happens in the future, I, I have no clue. Right now, this is what I'm focused on, and this is where my, my heart is, and we'll see how it goes and how effective I am. And if, if I'm doing good things, then I want to continue to be able to do good things for the state and for this country. Yeah, I'm not trying to lock you into term limits. I was just Yeah, curious. no, 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 no. But, but, but people have said that, well, you're moving up, right? You're moving up, and it's like, that's never been a plan. Yeah. I'm a big fan of, of moving yeah. up, uh, and I think people should, should do it, and I'm a big fan of, of women doing it. Uh, so uh, it's, it wasn't, it wasn't meant as a, as yeah. a slam, but I do have to ask you just in terms of your, your tenure as mayor and everything else, you are well yeah. known. Part of the reason you're well known is you're a little bit of a, uh, you're controversial. Uh, there's been a controversy here and there. No, you don't think so? Let me ask no. you. I, I honestly, I think that was media. I think that was a media created controversy. Do I think I did anything controversial? No. I think that the media was starved for a story and they, and they took off with it. <laughs> Let me ask you about it. So, uh, yeah. because I went down the rabbit hole in the story uh, yesterday. So, and so you just, you correct me if I'm wrong about any of the yeah. details. The, the way that the story was reported, uh, and, and I'll just, I'll, I'll do the short thing, short thing and let you actually give the details of it so I don't get anything wrong, but it sounded like yeah. uh, you just, you wanted to put forward uh, legislation to ban Sharia law there in the Dallas area. Um, okay. Yeah. So that's fine. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. That's the way that it was reported. But actually, if you go back, if you look at the, the council meetings, you look at the resolution. Yeah. Tell me the nature of the story so I don't get anything wrong. There was a, there was a, 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 a tribunal, an Islamic tribunal that had published a website and had put things out uh, in a press release and had done an interview at a mosque that was in one of the largest mosques in the country that was in Irving. And they talked about uh, creating this Islamic tribunal first in the country to be able to offer Muslims who were in the country an ability to practice Islamic law, comma, Sharia. Um, within a few days, that narrative went from um, first Sharia law court created in the city of Irving to Irving creating the first Sharia law court. Um, and obviously I had to respond to that as, as mayor, I put out a Facebook post that I was looking at it, but quite honestly, the more I looked at it and went to their website, there were some shocking things in there. For example, um, the four moms that were leading up this tribunal were calling themselves on their websites, attorneys, they were calling themselves judges. None of them had a law degree. Um, um, none of them were, were members of the state bar under areas of, of, of practice. They included things like divorce and child custody, um, um, business law, product liability. They were charging for their services. There were issues with their website that was not, um, that was not following American law. Um, and the more I looked into it and started talking with some attorneys, um, it was an issue. Um, I just said, as, as a, an elected official, my job is to make sure that we are upholding American laws, constitutional rights, basic fundamental rights provided by the Constitution and Texas state law. And I, we looked at it from a city perspective. We rejected the fact that we were not uh, creating this court. We were not recognizing it as a separate court. 
And when it came time to putting a resolution, there was a resolution that was down in Austin that was for American laws for American courts. For examples, when on, if, if a foreign law in cases of family law where a foreign law would actually violate an individual's constitutional right, that American law would be chosen over that foreign law in family courts. We decided that we were gonna support that resolution. The resolution did not mention Islam, Muslim, Sharia law, or anything. It just said in cases of foreign laws, if foreign law was actually enacted um, in American courts, they were gonna choose the American court, the American law um, to ensure that people's fundamental basic rights were not um, violated. That was it. Um, it should not have been a very high bar for any elected official to have to jump, but the media's response to it was absolutely insane. And, and they needed to create a circus to sell papers. But, you know, motivations were thrown out there that weren't honest. But at the end of the day, after speaking with divorce attorneys and others uh, where these cases were being brought forward in court, um, my major concern, I wrote about it, I spoke about it, put an article, uh, uh, an op-ed piece in the Dallas Morning News about it, was that women's rights could possibly be violated. You know, in cases where a woman has to have you know, three testimonials from women to overcome one testimony of a man, it's, it's, it, that should not happen in the U.S. So for me, I was defending not only the Constitution, not only the state laws of Texas, but also women's right to have equal access and equal representation under the law. And the, the media, instead of actually um, I'm looking into it, um, just found it uh, to be, I just found them to want to create a circus and a fight. And you know, controversy shouldn't be supporting you know, basic fundamental rights. So it's not a secret that Republicans are, are not attracting a great deal of minority support, generally. And, um, and I think right now, you know, racial strife is very much at the sort of top, is, is one of the top issues on people's minds. And I think that, uh, you know, when, when it feels like Republicans sort of highlight divisions on some of these things, that it, it makes it more and more difficult for us to attract uh, people that we might, might otherwise sort of like what Republicans have to offer? Or do you think I'm wrong about that, Beth? I, I, I think when you think about what parties highlight divisions, I would go back to the Democrat Party. Um, I, I look at what happened under Obama. It was always highlighting the divisions. Um, you know, and, and, and why this party is being treated, this, this person is being treated unfairly. I remember when I was mayor, again, most diverse zip code in the country, when you say that we're not being supported, why aren't uh, Republicans being supported by minorities? I was elected overwhelmingly with a majority of, of, of people in my city um, time and time again. And it's because I didn't talk about, we're going to do this for this group and we're going to do this. My focus was not on division. My focus is on what is the thing that the, that the, the government should be focused on that enhances all of our lives. Things like safe streets, Hold on. Hold on. transportation. Yeah. Because I, before we launch into, like, yeah. the President of the United States told uh, a number of Congresswomen of color uh, who were Americans to go back to where they came from. Like, that is a problem. I look, I look at Biden saying, you're not black if you don't vote for me. Um, you know, I, I look at Biden and, you know, making fun of, 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 of Hispanics. And saying, oh, well, they're much, and grouping these people. The fact is, as Americans, I don't think that you should prejudge anybody based on their gender, based on their religion, based on their culture, based on the color of their skin. I, yeah. I have found that people have different and various opinions based on their experiences. And all of those should be taken into account and respected. And I think when we start just putting people into these buckets that, you know, out of convenience sake, we're completely missing the boat. Yeah, so I really, I agree with the thing that you just said about, and, and I, you know, that we shouldn't prejudge people, all of that. And I think that there, Republicans should have a lot to offer uh, people of all faiths and all racial backgrounds, gender, et cetera. Um, but it does feel like there has been uh, too much of, of the Republican strategy trying to sort of divide people on these things. Like, I mean, with the George Floyd killing, you don't think yeah. that the president has been, and, and the Republican Party in general has been unnecessarily divisive in this moment. There's been not a single, the president has not, you know, used his bully pulpit to push rhetoric that is, talks about uniting the country or trying to heal racial division. It has all been pouring gasoline on the fire. 
So you're talking about, and I guess it's what I keep hearing is there's one voice that you're talking about, but then you're, you're using the word party. And when I hear the party talking about it, when I hear elected officials talking about it, I heard everybody condemn what happened to George Floyd. I heard everybody that, that, that was an elected official say on both sides of the aisle that it was wrong. I heard everybody say that we could do better. Um, and I look at it from my, my personal opinion, my, my personal experience. When I was mayor, um, when I was on council, I worked with our police officers. We built roads and bridges of trust within our communities, all of our communities. We had a, a police athletic league that worked with um, underprivileged kids in all areas of the city. We had a rape aggression defense course that brought in young girls and their moms, majority Hispanic, because that's what's in our, our, our Irving ISD, um, to bring in, to teach them to have a, a voice for themselves, but also give them an opportunity to work with our police officers on, on a trusting relationship before they're ever needed for law enforcement. I saw us create a, a, a program called Shop Talk that, that police officers went into black owned businesses and they worked with customers there just to get to know them as well as the owners. And I'll tell you a few weeks ago, we had um, a quarterly luncheon where we had Shop Talk, this is the Shop Talk um, program where we had um, um, black business owners come every quarter and have um, lunch with our police chief and our city manager. And a few weeks ago, I was talking to the city manager and he said that two of these individuals came in that were wearing Black Lives Matter t-shirts. And people were a little you know, skeptical what's, what's gonna happen with us. Both of the people who were wearing t-shirts praised our Irving police officers. And they said, if more departments were like this across the country, we wouldn't have a problem. But it's not blaming and, and criticizing after the fact. It's doing the hard work leading up to that to have these types of programs. And the leaders in these communities, the leaders in Congress, need to be promoting those things and supporting them and, and, and actually encouraging them as opposed to just throwing their entire police department under the bus. But when I think about what ha has happened since George Floyd, I'm sorry, I have seen the Republican voice shot down and this divisive voice that has been promoted on the radical left. I mean, well, Rep Republicans don't even have a voice right now. When we talk about people who are afraid to even speak up because they're gonna be attacked in public. You know, if you are wearing a, a red hat, you're gonna be attacked. If you've got a bumper sticker, or a Trump bumper sticker, or a Republican bumper sticker on your car, you're gonna be attacked. Those are the things that I'm seeing. Uh, and, and I don't know what, what, what news programs, but I try to watch all of them because I think you, know, you need to be informed from all sides. But what I'm seeing is, is, is Democrat-run cities and this crazy leftist mob, that are attacking any voice that don't agree with them. And I find that to be very divisive. But now I need one, each of you to convince me that despite how I feel about Donald Trump as a lifelong Republican, why should I vote for you? Valerie, tell me, what, tell me how you would answer that question. So, I mean, I go down to kind of the five principles where when I discovered that, you know, 25 years ago when I picked up the phone and I called the Republican, and I still remember the flyer that my congressman had had when I was trying to choose. One was jobs. It was a real focus on jobs, right? So, like, I was raised in a working class family where we lived paycheck to paycheck, almost became homeless. And I appreciate that the Republican principles leads with that. Let's get people working. Let's get you off welfare. My family, many of my family were on welfare. Right, so the first principle is jobs. Second is getting rid of regulation. You can put as many regulations as you want out there, but that's gonna take away from growth. That's gonna take away from opportunity. So what the Republican Party, when I looked at it, you know, a long time ago and I look today, I say, we wanna reduce regulation. We wanna encourage you to do, to do more. Third, a rule of law. So I grew up in my, when I was a kid, I used to pray at night, I had two prayers. One that I wouldn't get stolen. That was because our house had gotten broken into. And the second one was that I'd become a Jetson so I could fly to school because my walk was really, was really long, okay? So the third I would say is a rule of law is respect for our laws, be accountable for our choices, right? No matter what our circumstances are, respect our laws. We have a process in this country to change it, but you don't get to break them, right? So, so then fourth, lower taxes, in, encouraging working with the private sector, versus government getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. One reason why we came here to Illinois is I loved how government was managed from the bottom up versus the top down. I don't wanna give any more control to DC. I wanna give controls back to states. I wanna respect that, right? So, uh, I mean, I could go on and on and on, um, but well, I'll- yeah, because we gotta let you answer this question too. All right, well, make me split my ticket, Beth. 
I would say when you're going to the polling place, I would hope to win your support because you're looking at somebody who's actually been doing it and not just talking the talk, but actually walking the walk. Someone who's worked to, to provide safe streets in her city, safest city, you know, fifth safest city in the country. Somebody who worked to bring jobs to the city so that we had more economic growth than we've ever had before. Someone who stopped looking at division in, in what people wanted and tried to provide for all. I'd say look at what people have done, the experience that they're bringing to the table, um, the values that they hold. And I'd say, you know, I, during during a during a pandemic, being able to, to to campaign is a tough job. But also, I was elected mayor coming right out of a recession. And what we were able to do is take a city that was was could have possibly have been at the precipitous of financial ruin and make it thriving, um, provide services for all. And, and looking at what we did after uh, Hurricane Harvey when I was with HUD and all the support and the help that we brought to, to various communities across the state, across the region. And that's because you have relationships built upon trust, built upon effectiveness, and built upon experience. So I would hope to get your support because you've seen me actually do those things and has proven myself as a leader, proven myself as a, as a, as a, as a voice of region, reason, the, the adult in the room who was looking to bring pragmatic solutions to the city, to the state, to the country. And that's why I would hope to get your vote. All right. Uh, well, uh, if anything was going to make me uh, vote for, for you guys, it's the fact that when we, we decided to do this, uh, you guys both told me that I could ask you anything I wanted to during this panel, and you did, and I really appreciate it. Uh, and I thank you so much for your time. And I hope that uh, down the road, as, as we all try to figure out what's going on with, with our Republican Party, uh, that, that someday all of us can work together to build a, a center-right party in this country. But thanks very much. Thank you, Sarah. I appreciate the opportunity. It's great to see you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today and for these really thoughtful and smart conversations. If you liked what you saw today, we'd love it if you'd join us as founding members of the 19th. You can do that at 19thnews.org. The 19th is a member-supported newsroom, and we can't put on great free programming like this without your support. If you missed any part of this week's programming or you just want to watch again, visit 19thnews.org forward slash events. We are so excited to see you back here tomorrow for day four of the 19th Represents, where we'll talk about the myth of electability. The lineup includes former Secretary of State Hillary Rodham Clinton, New York Congresswoman Elise Stefanik, a performance of the New York Philharmonic and three amazing women composers, and a conversation on what it takes for women to win with Rutgers political science professor Kelly Dittmar, Hawaii Congresswoman and former presidential candidate Tulsi Gabbard, and author Jennifer Palmieri, the former communications director for Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign. A special thanks again to our generous sponsors and philanthropic partners, Goldman Sachs, Intuit, The Impact Seat, The Lenfest Institute, The Philadelphia Inquirer, The Wincote Foundation, the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, the Barbara Lee Family Foundation, the Stardust Fund, PEN America, the Heinz Endowments, CVS Health, the Panacea Collective, Aero PR, and Lingua Franca. We'll see you tomorrow.